Welcome back to another episode of Foolproof Theology. My name is Chase Davis, and I am your host, the supreme leader of Foolproof Theology, and I've been trying to record a bunch of episodes lately so I can get them out to uh, Patreon. So if you're on the Patreon, you can sign up there, get early access to all episodes. Go sign up over on the Patreon in the show notes. Uh, but today on the show, uh, this was actually a uh, conversation I've been really looking forward to. I heard him talk with Aaron Wren, and um, so some of the conversation some of the conversation will overlap. But this is uh, Brad Vermerlin. Brad, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Brad, you wrote a book called Reformed Resurgence. Came out in 2020, and yet this is uh, it's 2024 now as we're recording. Uh, this is the first time I'm kind of hearing of it. I think there were a couple of reviews. Um, when did you start this research? You're a sociologist. You're working at Calvin up in Grand Rapids. Um, and this is a sociological research, I mean, dissertation study published by Oxford University Press. When did you start this research? Came out in 2020. Why do you think it's been uh, kind of maybe underutilized or underappreciated? Right. As you said, this was my dissertation. Uh at, at Notre Dame in sociology. Um, I started the project in actually fall of 2012 and um, started gathering my data, visiting all different um, Calvinist me mega churches across the, the country, doing interviews with evangelical leaders. And most of the book, I'd say 85 ish percent of the book, actually was written and, and finished. Um, in spring of 2016. So I, fall of 2012 to spring of 2016 was the, the time frame I wrote, uh, researched and wrote most of the book. Um, having finished a PhD, uh, I then shelved it for about a year and a half uh, and did other things. Uh, but eventually got around to uh, writing that last 15% and doing some revisions and um, getting it published by Oxford. So that came out in, uh, in 2020. So, but now the book's four years old. Um, one of the reasons it's, uh, I think, uh, flying under the radar is Oxford priced it at um, initially $99 and then upped it to, I think, $110. So um, that's, I think that's part of the reason um, people are a little, uh, not as quick to pick it up. It's not a $25, $30 book. Yeah, for sure. I think that's, uh, you know, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for any of you uh, people who uh, you know, can have that kind of disposable income to, to pick up uh, books, but it sounds like a really important work. It is an important work uh, to kind of get us the conversation started uh, just for you and for the listener. I want to share why I find this so fascinating. Um, I grew up in the Southern Baptist church and a mega church in Dallas, Texas, went to Texas A&M and down at Texas A&M, I started getting into these things. This was 2005, 2009. I started studying Shane Claiborne. I got into kind of this neo-anabaptist. I didn't know what that was. I'm just a college student. I grew up in the church trying to explore different things. I had heard a lot about postmodernism in my Christian education, went to a private Christian school. And so we had talked about, you know, different approaches to postmodernism. But I get into college, get into kind of this neo-anabaptist world, but I'm still reading Piper. All of a sudden people are reading this guy named John Piper. Haven't heard of him. This guy in Dallas, uh, north of Dallas is Matt Chandler. All my friends are listening to him. And so I've got these big names on my radar graduate. Um, we, uh, we go to the mission field for a little while, me and my wife, then we get into ministry after I work some construction and I start seminary and I go to Denver seminary and I show up and we are planting a church in Boulder, Colorado, which is at part of Acts 29 and Acts 29 is well within the topic of your dissertation. Um, you've got figures like Darren Patrick, Mark Driscoll, Matt Chandler, um, with influences from Keller and Piper and such. In fact, uh, Acts 29 is having John Piper come speak at their national conference uh, in the next month, I think. Um, and so we plant this church. It's Calvinistic, complementarian. Um, just from the beginning, I go to Denver Seminary, and no one has ever heard of Matt Chandler. Uh, people have barely heard of Mark Driscoll. We tell them about Acts 29. No one's heard of it. And that was the first, like... Um, it was the first pause I gave to my, my participation in the movement because I was like, it seems really big when you're on the inside of it, but it, a lot of people haven't heard of it. And when I talk to local pastors too, a lot of people haven't heard of Tim Keller and any of these people, but to me and a lot of my friends, these are like big names. Well, fast forward a little bit, you know, we go through when you wrote your book, 
2016 uh, to 2020, it comes out. A lot has happened. Um, you know, I've had my own relationship. As listeners know, we got removed from Acts 29 in 2023 uh, unilaterally without warning, no process of appeal, uh, no due justice thing. You can go listen to that on your own time if you want. Um, and, and before all that, in 2020, our friend, Darren Patrick, who uh, we had a relationship with, he was on kind of a uh, uh, a board we had at a time at the time, um, and he was providing some some pastoral wisdom, some counseling to us, and he took his own life. And so, I just kind of summarized my participation in the movement anywhere from 2005 to 2009, all the way up until 2020. And then in 2020 hit, I started going like, "What is in the water here? What did I get sucked up into? How did I get caught up into it?" And so that's just that's just a little background uh, for the listener and for you to kind of know why these questions matter to me, because I'm approaching this as kind of an end user as a young guy who got caught up in this movement. And so I want to kind of understand from a sociological perspective, this is how you wrote your book from a sociological perspective, uh, where this movement came from and how it how it uh, kind of has it seems to punch above its weight class. I mean, it, I think you mentioned in the book, it's only five to 10 percent of the evangelical landscape. Could you could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, um, in terms of why I wrote the book, uh, I was, when you're in grad school for sociology, especially studying religion, you go to these conferences every year uh, where people are presenting their research and the surveys they've done on whatever topic. And, um, I was aware of this movement as well. I came to faith in, in an Acts 29 church also. Um, so what struck me at these conferences was we would present our research in the conference rooms and then we'd go out in the hallways. And a lot of the young scholars were talking about, did you hear what John Piper said last week? Or what do you think of Mark Driscoll and all this? And I realized nobody was actually studying this academically. And I thought I was well positioned to, to execute a book on that. So that's what I, what I did. And that was, I decided to do that in, I think, 2011. I um, wrote my dissertation proposal and got, got going on that. So um, it was a, a movement that I um, was and am sympathetic to as a Christian, but also thought that there needed to be an academic sociological book written um, on on this movement. So that's what I did. Uh, in terms of where it comes from, uh, you know, there's all sorts of articles that have been written. Uh, where did all these Calvinists come from is kind of the way they tend to phrase the titles. And so you can trace it back um, a lot, you know, as far as you want um, to the 1960s, 1970s, and all sorts of developments. But um, if I had to start, just kind of pick a random starting point, I do think that um, um, in well, there's a lot to say on this, but one thing I'll say is that the, I think the new new Calvinist or young restless reform movement can be thought of as a uh, reaction to the entire e emerging church conversation. Kind of, kind of, um, all these evangelical leaders and churches were part of this conversation about how to respond to postmodern philosophy and culture in the late '90s through the mid uh, like 2005 era, and um, it seems like a lot of evangelical leaders kind of got pressed through the emerging conversation and ended up in uh, several different spots. And one of those spots was a, uh, uh, a retrieval of uh, Calvinistic, reformed, complementarian type uh, Protestant theology. So um, in one sense, it was, I mean, think about um, the, the founding of the Gospel Coalition in 2006 and seven. Part of that seems obvious that it was response to this apparent drift of evangelicalism in the emerging conversation. And they wanted to kind of reclaim what they saw as the, the center uh, of evangelicalism with a reformed angle on it. So uh, postmodern philosophy, the emerging church conversation were two of the, the biggest um, places where this movement came from. Of course, these, these actors existed prior to the 1990s. I mean, you have R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur and John Piper and uh, other people who were preaching and teaching and writing books decades before that. It's just that it didn't coalesce as a movement or at least a identifiable movement with a name um, until the new millennium. And of course, Colin Hansen's work uh, naming the movement and putting it on the map with his own book uh, also was a big factor. So with the movement itself, I mean, launching in 2006, seven, eight, um, you've got Acts 29, late nineties founding, um, I'm coming into this and I'm like 19, 20 years old. I didn't know anything about the gospel coalition. Hadn't heard about these guys just grew up in a very mega church, Southern Baptist church. Um, and so I'm curious the generational gap, because a lot of these guys, like I think uh, Keller planted in the eighties 
is the Gospel Coalition and the Reform Resurgence as a whole, was it kind of a boomer, uh, generationally speaking, G boomer or Gen X? Like who were the, what was the age range of the leaders in the movement? Yeah, I would say it was pretty much uh, boomer led in terms of Keller Piper. Driscoll was probably Gen X, right? But it was in terms of who was kind of coming into or being swept into the movement, it was largely a millennial movement. But yeah, the oldest leaders would have been, um, or still are, I suppose, um, the boomer generation, people who are John Piper's age. Um, and there's some younger leaders, uh, Darren Patrick, Mark Driscoll, Matt Chandler would probably be Gen X age. Um, and then, like I said, the, it was really among the, the younger crowd of millennials at the time who uh, formed the kind of people in the pews. Yeah. And that's what I sense too. I mean, I, I felt like I was a, when I listened to your interview with Rand, I was like, dude, I was like a target market for these people. I don't know if they in, like would say that, but like being a millennial, you know, uh, kind of in the waters of postmodern conversations, I was writing papers in seminary on the emergent church versus the emerging church, which is a interesting distinction, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I guess one question I would, want to posit to you would be when you're in it, the reformed resurgence, this kind of whole ecosystem, desiring God, crossway, uh, nine marks, uh, just any, any of these figures and, and publishers and institutions, it feels really big. In fact, they, I mean, they were featured on time magazine as one of the biggest things, but is this just common whenever you're in a movement and you're caught up into it? Is this just common that you have an inflated sense of your own importance, or is this particular particularly prob a problem within the reform resurgence where these people kind of have a sense that they're making an impact that's bigger than 90% of the evangelical churches in America? Right. I don't know if it's particular to the reformed resurgence uh, that they, um, when you're a person, a young person in this movement, that, that it seems like uh, the whole world of American evangelicalism. I suppose if you were in a Assemblies of God mega church down south, maybe the Assemblies of God denomination would feel like your whole world or something like this. But you're right that it, it does create this, um, this in terms of like the phenomenological experience of a young evangelical Christian in his 20s or 30s, um, it could have felt like, you know, this is all of American evangelicalism. And I actually interviewed people and interacted with people uh, when I was gathering data for the book who um, the, the new Calvinism just was Christianity to them. Um, and so I, I don't have strong data that tells me that the Reformed resurgence constituted, like I say in the book, somewhere between 5 and 15 percent of American evangelicalism. But that's that's a hunch I have in terms of when you think about all the other denominations and expressions. Uh, I mean, a, even a minority of evangelical leaders would even say that they hold a Calvinistic soteriology. So already we're below 50 percent. Um, and then thinking about all the different denominations and networks you have all the other church planning networks that are just as big, if not bigger than Acts 29, like, um, what is it? Association of related churches. And there's some others that, um, are, are egalitarian maybe, or assemblies of God, or there's just so much going on. If you might, I don't know how much you'd want to count confessional Lutherans as evangelicals. I mean, they own the word originally, but, um, you have, um, Wesleyans and a Baptist. And if we're going to include, uh, progressive, Christians, uh, so to speak, in the evangelical fold, if they're claiming the label of evangelical to themselves, and it gets even bigger and more messy. So in terms of Acts 29, Desiring God, Nine Marks, the Gospel Coalition, and the whole neo-reform movement, it really is, uh, it turns out just in a kind of statistical numerical sense to be uh, a rather small minority of what's going on in the broader evangelical landscape. But um, it, it becomes um, this kind of small world for people who are in it, and it it can seem like it is um, all of all of the evangelical conversation. Um, and, and there are ways to foster that uh, if you're an evangelical leader. There are ways to to maintain that uh, in terms of um, punching above your weight, so to speak. And there's all sorts of issues involved about publishing and finances that we can talk about as well. Yeah, and that's I actually want to get into that because some of the stuff that I appreciate, um, you know, sociology is its own discipline, its own academic discipline, and there's certain ways you do uh, certain methods, certain strategies to evaluate uh, different sociological movements. But you bring up field theory, 
in your work. And I'm really curious to hear more about that from a sociological perspective, not only uh, from a theory perspective, but how it was utilized. I mean, like that, I don't think anyone in the movement would say we are going to use field theory to uh, to implement our vision. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting way to analyze the situation. So what is field theory and how does it play out or how did it play out in the reformed resurgence? Right. So this is one of the main take home points of the book. Um, one way to get started thinking about uh, what the point is, is uh, it, and the question would be, is the strength and substance of this new Calvinist movement primarily a quantitative uh, phenomenon in terms of numbers, more people involved in Calvinist complementarian conservative churches, or is it more something going on qualitative um, in terms of positioning and strategy and marketing and all sorts of other factors that may be going on that uh, are beyond the numbers? And that's one of the main themes of the book is that um, while there uh, was a somewhat of a numerical uh, uptick in young people involved in Calvinism, I, I think that's undeniable. I think that that's actually the least interesting part of this movement and that the more interesting uh, part in terms of the strength and success and vis visibility of this movement, uh, it's all qualitative factors that are beyond, uh, above and beyond the numbers and the numerical increases that we might find. So field theory is what I used, um, actually a specific flavor of field theory called strategic action field theory in sociology. And the sense here is that it's, uh, instead of looking at, so a, a field, we talk about, you know, I work in the field of uh, banking or I work in the field of education. It's, it's along those lines. A field in sociology is a specific meaning. It's a, a domain or a sphere of life, okay? Uh, and and you, you may even think of it as a, and as an arena. So some kind of like a, a space, a social space, uh, a domain of life. Um, and there's certain characteristics of fields in sociology. Um, one of them is that um, the whoever is in a field, is kind of like you're in a magnetic field or a gravitational field, to use that kind of physics metaphor, where depending on your location in the field, you will feel um, compelled or pulled or pushed in certain directions ideologically, uh, towards certain leaders and experiences and so on. So that's one thing is that these social fields, uh, as a metaphor, work kind of like uh, uh, fields in physics, that there are certain vectors that you uh, find yourself on. But also that these are also battlefields uh, where you have different teams of people um, vying for position and advantage in and over the field. So that's kind of two, the, the two sides of the coin of field theory is this um, physics metaphor, like gravitation or, or magnetism, where you, you actors feel uh, uh, this kind of impulsion or compulsion uh, to follow certain paths through the field, depending on where they originated, and then also the fighting and the vying and the jockeying for position over the field. And so the, the key move that the book makes is rather than looking at, at American evangelicalism as a religious tradition or as a religious movement in any kind of unified way, I analyze American evangelicalism itself as a field. So the field is American evangelicalism. So the key move that it makes is, is that it looks at and analyzes evangelicalism as an arena, social arena, where you have fighting and jockeying going on for power in and over the field. And, and once you kind of make that turn intellectually and look at evangelicalism as a, as a field in this sense, rather than as a movement or a tradition, it, it really kind of comes to life in terms of identifying the teams and the tribes, seeing the strategies that they uh, use and the, the um, other sorts of qualitative factors that, um, really tell a whole story about the evangelical field as a whole. So the book's not just about the neo-reform movement. It's about the broader uh, American evangelical field and the role that the neo-reform movement um, has played in it, if this is making sense. Yeah, I know that makes complete sense. And I, just from personal experience, I can, I can sense that. Um, I might come in, you know, from a more uh, strictly theological discipline where I'm at, I might analyze it differently, but uh, those words are very compelling to me in terms of gravitational pull. I sense that in my own heart. Uh, the, the, there's, a, uh, there's both a pressure and an attraction uh, with different leaders. So you, you want to go to the latest conference. You want to read the latest book. You want to promote the right people and distance yourself from the right people. You want to make sure you uh, call out Rob Bell 
and celebrate Tim Keller. In fact, I, you know, to my, to my own immaturity at the time when I would have people, cause as a pastor, uh, you, you typically get people from a, a variety of, of, uh, not only, uh, religious, uh, perspectives because they'll be converted in the church and become Christian. Uh, but you also get people from a variety of evangelical backgrounds, whether it's Lutheran, Catholic, Methodist, Assemblies of God, you know, ARC megachurch, and you're, you're, you're interacting with them. And then as a pastor, I think this is one of the critiques I've, uh, I've been kind of mulling over and I've publicly written about it with Acts 29 kind of being a brand uh, more than an institution. It's, it's, you feel a loyalty uh, and a and a desire to defend uh, the brand or, or even a figure in the brand like Tim Keller. We used to use a lot of Tim Keller. Uh, you know, his book Center Church was very formational for me and our church. And then I'd get people who had never heard of him and then they would critique Kim, Tim Keller and I would get very defensive instead of instead of having a, a reasonable conversation about pros and cons of Tim of of him as a thinker or whatever it may be his writings. I I, I was like how my my heart I mean to my shame was like, how dare you question Tim Keller? You know, he's the guy. And so I sense what you're describing play out uh, a lot, not only in the interaction in the pool, but also in the um, the jockeying for position, which is very, uh, I would say, subconscious because there's not a lot of rules in terms of like, if you get these degrees or if you do these things, then you will get access to the table or what we're going to publish you. It's, it's very subtle and it's informed by social networks and who, you know, and, um, and that kind of thing. So does that, does that kind of, does my experience kind of map onto that and, and track with what you've described in the book? Yeah, those are precisely the types of dynamics, um, that I spell out in the book. Um, I, I, I do want to highlight that the, the, the book is less focused on the experience of, uh, just ordinary evangelicals in the pews. And it's exclusively a, a book about evangelical leaders uh, as, as leaders. So pastors, well-known high-profile pastors, seminary professors, and not just those in the Calvinist pocket or fold, but also, you know, Rob Bell, um, Tony Jones in the emergent uh, kind of area, um, and also what I just call mainstream evangelicalism, um, you know, the kind of Rick Warren um, type uh kind of just vanilla mainstream evangelicalism so the book's all about the the leaders and what what they're doing and less so about the experience of the people in the pews but and then i also do spell out in terms of jockeying for position you're right that it is uh and this was something i thought of theoretically in the book as well it seems a little uh counterintuitive to have this kind of subconscious jockeying but that's what it is and this kind of subconscious uh strategic position taking but so how do you stick out a position strategically in a field subconsciously? But that turns out to be exactly what's going on um, in evangelicalism. So in terms of, I mean, think of all, all sorts of things that the, the neo-reform movement did that turned out to be really strategic for them in terms of punching above their weight. Uh, the focus on um, urban centers and kind of urban, uh, highly educated people in cities is something that um, they were, I think, dispositionally drawn toward. Uh, but also turned out to be a almost a, a strategic position to gain advantage in in uh, American evangelicalism. It's partly conscious, a conscious decision, but in terms of um, well, it was very much a, a conscious strategy on, on, on the part of some people. But there was also this kind of subliminal, subconscious pull toward urban urban settings. Um, in terms of um, um, the whole gender issue. Um, complementary putting putting forth a, a complementarian um, view of of men and women. Uh, few few people would think of, want to talk about that as um, staking out a strategic position in the field. Uh, but if you think about it as kind of working below the level of, of conscious awareness, it did kind of serve that purpose uh, in terms of uh, being a strategy, being able to, to appeal to history, and this is the tr you know traditional historic whatever view of men and women. Uh, you know, there's progressives would debate that and, and say that it was just kind of invented or something. Um, there's a whole debate there, but in terms, the, the the point is that um, there's there's strategic position taking and discourse, strategic discourse as well that happens almost almost subconsciously. Um, one thing that I, I highlight in the book is this kind of just matter of fact Calvinism, where it's um, if there's this public speaking, public discourse that happens uh, or did happen where it was essentially 
listen, if you're want if you're going to read the Bible in an honest, fair-minded way, you're just going to end up being a Calvinist. It's just kind of matter of fact, um, taken for granted, um, obviousness of. And this goes back to you know Charles Spurgeon, that Calvinism is the gospel, and that that type of talk turned out to be a very strategic um, uh, maneuver, especially when when you have young men, millennials, listening to it. So there's um, several more factors that all these I highlight as strategic position takings within the American evangelical field um, with with various levels of of intentionality and consciousness to them. Yeah, that's great. So I I know tons of church planners who who wanted to go to either urban or liberal settings because it was just the assumed norm. It was like the air we breathed, like, well, this is just what you do. And I think that's why I have a lot of sympathy for, I mean, I'm a pastor, so I, I naturally have sympathy for other pastors who are, who are uh, doing things, particularly church planters. But I know many stories of, of pastors who kind of were, were end users. Uh, I don't know if that's the right sociological word, but that's what comes in my mind of kind of this movement. Um, and, and they just make decisions maybe because the whole movement just says, this is what's good and right and you should do. And then they go, okay, I will do that. Um, and it's hard, I guess, in my position is like, how do you not become so, I mean, if you look at it that way, you can become very jaded and cynical. Um, it's just this, it's just this normal human react. I mean, this is common in any field, right? Is this, is this normal for everybody or is this unique to the reformed resurgence? Yeah. So one concept in sociology that may be helpful there is what we call institutional isomorphism, institutional isomorphism. And what that means is essentially you have all these organizations uh, that constitute a field. And uh, in, in a sense, they're, they're largely just copying and mim- mim- mimicking each other. Um, few, a very small number of organizations in a field might be taking the lead and truly innovating. Whereas what happens is that the kind of best practices and strategies tend to diffuse throughout the field in a way that everybody's just copying everybody else. This is why uh, most evangelical megachurch websites look the same and have the same tabs at the top because there's just kind of this standard, like this is what an evangelical megachurch website looks like, you know, one church, many locations. So, um, and you, you see this process um, in, 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 in any organizational field, but also uh, in American evangelicalism. So uh, people um, are just looking around and seeing what is the thing to do? How, how do we do this? Um, and and that's, that's what sociologists call institutional isomorphism. Uh, just, just a bunch of actors in this kind of domain of life, all basically copying each other to figure out what to do. Yeah, I've joked about this because uh, with my background in construction, uh, you'll notice that many construction companies or subcontractors have very generic, similar, similar named businesses, uh, you know, uh, AJ construction or, or, or something very like common. Uh, there's not a lot of, I mean, you'll get some big ones that are, that are innovative, so to speak, but they're doing a lot of the same stuff and that's not necessarily a problem, but I think it's interesting as a, a religious phenomenon uh, in the evangelical movement in America to look at it that way, because I don't think many people are looking at it that way. That's all I find this uh, so interesting. One of the things you talk about is how in field theory, in these different domains, an arena and that kind of thing, they use they use different types of tactics. And I was wondering if you could share some of those. I know you've talked about symbolic power, symbolic capital, um, which includes like uh, prestige, clout, recognition. You've talked about gatekeeping. What are some of these tactics that not just evangelicals, not just this movement, but but yes, particularly them, since that's what we're talking about. What are the tactics they use to kind of either assert uh, or or maintain control? Right. So I make a distinction in the book between a tactic and a strategy. So a tactic would be something that any actor in the field can do. And there's kind of no zero sum competition in terms of tactics. They're just best practices that anybody can do. So having a having a polished website, for example, would be a tactic. A strategy is different where a, a strategy means setting yourself apart from others in the field. Uh, so not everybody can have the same strategy or else it's not a strategy in a, in a field. And I borrow, I borrow from uh, Michael Porter's theory of strategy in, in the business literature on this. Um, and so I, I argue that the, the neo-reformed or new Calvinist leaders 
um, consciously or not, uh, enacted several strategies in the American evangelical field in order to um, gain various types of what in field theory is called capital. The most important one being symbolic capital, which is this kind of, like you said, clout or esteem, very qualitative. You see the qualitative nature of symbolic capital there. It's not always about the numbers. It's about clout, esteem, recognition, reputation. And that symbolic uh, capital is the prerequisite for having what we also call in sociology symbolic power, which is uh, power over a field, especially the power of our words to name things and categorize things. Uh, so uh, use strategies to achieve symbolic capital, which in turn lays the foundation for uh, holding and enacting symbolic power over the field of American evangelicalism. So what might some of those strategies be for the neo-reformed movement? I already mentioned some of them. Um, a focus on urban centers in big cities, kind of this kind of cosmopolitan, urbane, sophisticated feel of the movement. It seems like the target audience did tend to be people with college degrees, for example. Um, that was one thing. Like if you were a smart, educated evangelical in your 20s with a college degree, you just paid attention to Tim Keller and John Piper. That's just what you did. So that was that was one uh, the kind of urbane and urban uh feel of the movement uh i mentioned the focus on complementarian uh, gender uh beliefs that is a strategy in the sense that um it's not going to make so the, the thing about a strategy in a field it's not going to make everybody happy it's not going to be for everybody it's going to draw and attract a certain target audience um, and so in that sense the um the complementarian gender views for however genuine those beliefs are, also turned out to be uh, a strategic position taking in, in the field. The discourse about um, the kind of obvious hermeneutic of uh, leading to Calvinist uh, conclusions, and I, I document this in the book uh, many times over with people like um, Al Mohler talking about, like this is the only option for, for people with decent hermeneutics and evangelicalism. They're just gonna end up being a Calvinist and in this movement, uh, for example. Um, other strategies, um, let's see, um, those are some of the main ones. Um, uh, the kind of masculine bent to the, the movement, um, kind of built on the complementarian um, uh, angle and provided something for men in their 20s through, especially Mark Driscoll and uh, Darren Patrick, I think, um, that turned out to be a strategic position taking in the field of American evangelicalism. Again, not to say it's disingenuous, uh, but it did end up being strategic. Um, um, several others. And these um, strategic position takings uh, morph into fighting and boundary drawing, because one of the other strategic positions that many of the leaders took up in the field was that of gatekeeper. They strategically positioned themselves as the arbiter of true evangelicalism. Not all of them, but some of them did. And so that's where the strategic position taking translates into vying for position and jockeying and boundary drawing and gatekeeping. So there's this kind of natural, through that specific strategic position taking of, uh, of gatekeeper, you end up... Um, I really wish this. I really wish I had made this two chapters in the book rather than one. Uh, uh, so transitioning from thinking about strategic positions to once one of those strategic positions is gatekeeper, the way that that creates all sort of battles within evangelicalism, and so in the very act of drawing lines and boundaries, and gatekeeping uh, theological issues, moral issues, um, some of which, as um, I'm a traditional Christian, so some of which don't I think are very valid uh, things to gatekeep. Uh, don't get me wrong. Um, I think um, create all sorts of uh, uh, tensions and problems and fights within the evangelical field. Um, you can think of the world vision controversy when they for only a, a, a brief time changed their, um, their policy on uh, their employees um, being in a same sex marriage, so to speak. Um, you can think of the Rob Bell controversy in terms of, is it appropriate for evangelical Christians to um, be something like a universalist um, gatekeeping on sexuality issues uh, with, with more progressive um, 
people coming out with non-traditional sexual ethics and the very clear boundary drawing on those, open theism. I mean, the topics go on and on about what the kind of policing and boundary drawing within evangelicalism has been over the last 20 years. And so a lot of the evangelical and, spe and specifically these Calvinist leaders position themselves as, as kind of policing that and, and guiding that and saying, we're, we're going to be the ones who call the balls and strikes. Um, I don't mean to sound super cynical about that, because again, I think as a traditional Christian, there's kind of taking off my sociologist hat, putting on my Christian hat. Some of that's very legitimate. But also thinking sociologically, we have to be aware of the purpose that these serve uh, uh, for movement dynamics. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm wondering, you know, you've got these uh, kind of verbal uh, spoken gatekeeping. Um, one thing I've encountered in, in churches uh, in evangelicalism is kind of this concept of the 11th commandment. Um, where you won't speak ill of your brother and that kind of thing. This is very popular in like more charismatic uh, expressions of evangelicalism, assemblies of God, that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I would say uh, from our experience, we violated some unspoken rule and we were gate kept out of, you know, Acts 29. Um, you know, I, I have lots of theories on what, what unspoken rule we violated. I, you know, they weren't very clear when they, they removed us. However, I'm curious, were there unspoken rules? that you identify in the book that uh, that you saw within the uh, reformed resurgence? Yeah, so one of the main conceptual uh, parts of field theory in sociology is this idea of the rules of the game. So the whole field jockeying thing is also could be thought of uh, with the metaphor of, of a game. Uh, not to make it sound trivial, but um, there's, there's strategic positioning, um, that, that happens and you're trying to win a game essentially. And so the rules of the game in American evangelicalism sometimes, um, are, are made clear and, and sometimes are left, uh, unspoken. So the main rules that I highlight in the, in the book is I actually take the, the, the Bebbington quadrilateral and the four marks that he highlights as being an evangelical, uh, an emphasis on the crucifixion, um, the emphasis on the authority of the Bible, um, activism in terms of being kind of active and having this missionary zeal in the world. And um, what was the fourth one? So crucicentrism, activism, biblicism, and uh, is it conversionism? The emphasis on being reborn, I believe. So I took the, the, the what are marks yeah. of the Bebbington yeah. quadrilateral. I turned them from marks or features into rules. And uh, I think those actually function less as features of evangelicalism as they are kind of deep rules that must not be violated. So when you hear people um, critiquing open theism, they critique it uh, for breaking the rule of biblicism, not taking the Bible seriously in appropriate ways or something. And whenever there's a, a something that needs to be gatekept or, or renounced, it's in terms of usually um, a rule violation, uh, oftentimes one of those four, um, those four things from Bevington. Um, and some of this, uh, again, it's super interesting uh, the, to think about the various levels of intentionality and consciousness and everything going on here. So there's also um, uh, these kind of, rules can be made explicit, but also unspoken. And um, one of the key features of field theory, and I think it's, it perfectly fits with evangelicalism, is that part of the battle, part of the vying and jockeying is precisely a, a battle over the rules. So it's not that we tend to think of rules when we sit down to play a board game as just settled and they define the game. But in sociological field theory, the, the, the game is played um, in kind of this loose relationship with the rules where the, a fight over defining the rules is part of the game itself. Um, so that, that's what we see in evangelicalism. So what does it mean to be appropriately uh, uh, take the Bible as, as an authority or what is it? What does it mean to um, appropriately think about um, the, the crucifixion of Jesus in the appropriate way or, and so on? So the, the rules are what we call endogenous to the system. They're not kind of set and defined beforehand. They're part of the, the, the play of the field itself. Um, in terms of what new Calvinists did, um, we could talk about all sorts of uh, um, things about, you know, you, you, you can't speak ill of, of, of this person or that person and this kind of more, uh, more unspoken, uh, just norms that, um, that also would, would receive some kind of uh, negative sanction, um, from leaders. Yeah. Before I let you go, one question I have just as a sociologist, you, you identify in the book, 
that the emergent conversation uh, produced the neo Anabaptist Shane Claiborne and these other figures, as well as uh, you know the New Calvinist, um, and that was a response kind of coming out of postmodernism. We're we're in 2024 now. I'm curious as you kind of look at the landscape today. Um, is there a pressing question that is creating new movements today that you're seeing out there in the landscape that you're going, okay, if that happened then, I mean, these were kind of reactions and responses to that conversation. What conversation is happening today and what new movements are you seeing today as a response to that big question in culture? Yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Something like if, if it was postmodernism 20 years ago and some, some new movements emerged out of that, what's the conversation today? Um, uh, I would say part of it is kind of a, a reawakening of Protestant political theology and uh, a critique, as you as you are well aware, a critique of this kind of very specific and historically unique posture of winsomeness and, and, and a, uh, taking an apolitical view of, of things over the last 20 years. Um, and, and so in terms of the, the broad political culture in the United States at a, at a national level, and the uh, where our culture is on controversial hot button social issues around gender and sexuality, um, immigration and all sorts of things. Um, it really seems like and I know Colin Hansen has, has made this argument uh, as well in the past that public public theology or political theology uh, seems to be kind of the new uh, post like if postmodernism was the conversation 20 years ago. Um, political theology seems to be the hot issue now. And so that's where we see um, this kind of new space opening up to the, to the right, uh, so to speak, of, of the new Calvinists in terms of um, kind of the American reformer, uh, what you might call post-liberal approaches to uh, evangelical public life, kind of a revisiting of the moral, major moral majority type posture toward public life and thinking, uh, what, what went wrong? Did something go wrong? What can we learn? about a more assertive uh, uh, Christianity in public life. And I, at least that's where I see evangelicalism now in terms of the, if you can understand evangelicalism in another way as a public kind of online, largely conversation uh, that happens uh, you know, online and in these kind of periodicals, uh, there seems to be a lot of energy around that right now. Uh, um, so I'm not sure where, what will kind of shake out in the next 10 years in, in terms of um, where things are, the, the evangelical field does tend to be, you know, rearranged uh, recurrently every 15 to 20 years. Uh, but that seems to be um, the current moment we're in. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that tracks onto what I'm seeing too, but I'm not a sociologist. I'm just a pastor, a theologian, but I, I, I see the same thing. It would be interesting if in 2030 or 2035, you were to do a similar type project on this current time we're in, a look back because it's hard in the midst of it to say, is this just a blip? Is this just a, a, a very narrow conversation? Because I see it as very actually broad within evangelicalism. I mean, from, from different denominations, different networks, different leaders, different figures. Um, and in, in the waters, a lot of populism, a lot of uh, both anti-institutionalism and a lot of people looking to build new institutions. So new institutions are starting up, new publications, uh, new podcasts, all that kind of stuff. And so it'll be interesting to look back in 10 years and kind of do another assessment and go, what were the rules and what were, what were the strategies, what were the tactics and what were kind of the, the different positionings people took to say, we are this, and that's going to alienate some people and attract some people. So hopefully, uh, I mean, it seems like you did really good work on this one. Maybe you'll have it in the tank to do another one in 10 years. Yeah. I just had a thought on that where it's um, sometimes these movements like the new Calvinism or the new reformed get kind of um, criticized as being flashes in the pan or being trends or fads even. Um, and I would just, my thought right now is that um, in terms of evangelical history developing, developing in the United States, that's all, that's all that evangelicals have is that don't, don't just miss these as trends and fads. These are historical moments in the public life of evangelicalism in the United States. They are what they are. I mean, we're going to look back at the emerging church conversation. Was that a, a trend and a fad? Yeah, but it was also part of evangelical history in America. Same with the neo-reform movement and same with what's happening now. Don't dismiss them as just trends and fads, even though they are they are partly that. They're also um, just part of the, the larger story of evangelicalism continuing in America. Yeah, that's great. 
Well, Brad, this is a great conversation. I'll make sure to put a link to uh, to the book in the show notes. Anywhere else I can direct people to keep up with your work, whether it's you know where you're teaching or a podcast or a website, anything like that you want me to put in the show notes for people? Uh, my professional website is just bradvermerlin.com where you could see kind of what I've published and what I'm working on. So that'd be pretty much it. Okay, excellent. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Hey, if you're a listener and you enjoyed this episode, uh, give it a great rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening to podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, I think they say smash that subscribe button. Uh, give it a rating, share the episode. That's the best way to get the content out there. And then sign up on the Patreon if this conversation blesses you and you want to stay in, in touch. You want to uh, give me some prompts that you can share with me about who you want to hear from, what book you're reading. I'd love to have those conversations over on the Patreon and you can get early releases to all episodes over there. So sign up in the show notes for that. And we will see you next time.